What's up guys, this is Characters and welcome to the 200th video that I have produced <clears throat> for GrandSchool.com. Um, exciting day, kind of scary day because you know time really flies and I can't believe I'm like I made my 100th video special what feels like a few weeks ago, it's actually been a few years um, and I'm like halfway and that was like halfway through my grinder school career, really kind of weird. Um, but it's been a total pleasure making these videos for the last sort of five years that I've been doing this gig for. Um, really fun, obviously, to talk about poker and educate people at the same time because poker is what I love. It's always been my kind of passion in life, even when it's my job, you know. It's still something that I have a lot of time and energy for and something that continues to perplex me and, you know, just intrigue me every day and I discover more and more about myself as a poker player and about this game. So what I wanted to do today was just commemorate the fact that it's been 200 videos, 200 weeks of, of characters, um, and I guess express my gratitude for a bunch of things that have helped me in my poker career so far, but the educational point of this video is to basically show you guys the most common failings of the average poker player. Because, okay, when I made my 100th video, I was a poker coach back then, but I wasn't coaching anywhere near full time. I was mainly like playing poker. I was still in university. I was doing other stuff. Um, and that video was all about what I learned about myself as a poker player. And I want to shed some light on not just me, but like the most common average poker player, the grinder that comes to me for coaching before I've done any work on their game. What is it that's stopping them succeeding? Why is it they needed the coaching? Why are they not succeeding on their own? Or even in many other cases, why do they still not succeed after coaching? Coaching is not a free ticket to crushing poker. It's not a guaranteed um, wild card into being like a 500 NL Zoom specialist. All it is is an aid, a guide, a mentor, um, and direction that if you follow and you put in all the effort on your own and you sort of get the most out of, out of coaching by making sure that your work ethic is good, you follow your coach's advice, you do the work in between sessions, you get involved with the student community and all these things, then you're very likely to do well if you've got enough natural, logical poker talent in the first place, which most people do who take this game seriously and are attracted to this game. But nevertheless, some people do become successful poker players, and this includes people who get coached and people who don't, and most people don't, and here are five reasons why. And kind of shocking truth to a lot of you guys, um, I would say that there are many students I have who I do my best for, but I assume don't don't make it as a, as a successful poker player because there are just too many obstacles in their way that they've not managed to overcome in five hours of coaching time or <clears throat> whatever it is they've bought. So, like I say, I've what I really want is for people to be aware of the things that they can do on their own and the things that hold people back. Because I don't want this to be the case within the community that I teach. I don't want it to be the case that most people don't actually succeed in poker. It is difficult and the nature of the game at rake dictates that most people will fail. This is this is normal. But I want the people watching this video and the people who work with me to have a much, much, much higher chance of success than the average player who has about a 90% chance of failing, to be honest. Just a random aspiring poker player. It's sick, but most people just don't make it in this game. So I want to change that. It's kind of my mission in this video is to show you why both new students and even continuing students fail despite my best efforts, which I'm always trying to improve. But like I say, I can't guarantee success because there are a lot of things that people do wrong. So we're going to play a game where you're going to get a picture and you're going to be able to, in most cases, probably guess what this leak is or what the problem is here in each slide. There are going to be five of these slides. So the first one, um, your sample size is too damn small. This is a big problem. People are incredibly results orientated. The average student, one reason that they tend to have bad mental game issues, they tend to be, um, they quit poker for a while or they're just really emotional about the way it's going is that they don't actually understand how much of what's going on is luck in the short term. They don't understand the insignificance of their sample and as a result they become deluded and think that their game has fallen apart or that they're crushing and then how can they not be crushing anymore when they were crushing for those 
5,000 hands or whatever. Um, there are two types of results orientatedness, if you like, two broad types. You can be results orientated in more ways than just these two. Um, maybe we'll talk about those after, but these are the main ones. One, hand results orientation. For example, I lost, so it must have been wrong. This is a problem because what this does is that it completely skews your ability and your approach to analyzing your own sessions and analyzing your own hand histories and reviewing, reviewing your own play and your own hand histories is super important when it comes to improving in this game. If you don't review, you don't get the objective post-session take on what you could have done better. You don't find mistakes, you don't find improvements, at least you don't find them in a way that is detached from the action unemotional because the money is no longer an issue because that's in the past and objectively where you don't have like emotional thoughts you know clouding your judgment of whether it was a good play i've had students before i'll say what's how do you review your own game and they'll just say they do it in game like they make a play and then they question whether it was good or bad i mean this is terrible you need to actually do it out of game but the problem with it is that in game people are very very results orientated you lose a big pot by calling the river it's almost impossible not to have the thought at least enter your mind that your call was wrong. As you become a better poker player, you come to accept that your call was right even though you lost. On many occasions, especially where it's more obvious. But if it's close and I make a call that I think, you know, this could go either way, I'm really not sure here. It might not even be close objectively. It might just be that I don't know what to do. If I make a call like that, then I'm straight away just going to think it was bad, even if it was good. So even experienced players are doing this, like, the brain is very, it's just wired in a way that it wants to look at results first and it wants to, it wants to tie results to, to performance because that's the way it works in reality. If you don't get promoted in your job, usually it's because you're not good enough. If you do get promoted, usually you've, it's on merit and you've done something right. Not always, obviously, but there are exceptions. But in general, yeah, there's a disconnect in poker between short-term results and the way you actually played, and this is something that people struggle with. If you suffer from hand results orientation, you're going to continuously second-guess yourself, go in cycles where you correct good play and fail to correct bad play, teach yourself that results are what matters, so the more you do this, the more it actually enforces in your subconscious brain that you should judge yourself based on the results of one hand, and you just get into a terrible, awful situation. You know how many times like I'll tell a student to pick out hands? Um, it could be that they have a problem folding, so I might look at like big pots where they had a decision to fold or not to fold. And so often, before they're good at this, when they're just getting started, they'll pick out hands that are just ridiculously obvious coolers. They have like second set and run into top set or something. But the instinct is just strong to assume that you've done something wrong when things go wrong. So you need to get over this by just in game for one delaying your analysis until you're out of game unless you have a heap of downtime generally it's not a good idea to dwell on whether something was or was not a mistake this just causes what's called mistake tilt where you give yourself a beating emotionally and you end up denting your own confidence and you just create an emotional imbalance that's bad for future decision making in that session so you want to avoid that and postpone it, file it away, compartmentalize it to a later time that day or the next day when you're going to do your review. And then you objectify the situation and you always hide villain's whole cards in the replayer. Make sure that when you post a hand in a forum or in the community that your coach runs or whatever, that you always omit results and try to be objective about it and don't say something like, well, villain had this, so obviously my play was bad. Your play is made a point of decision. Hindsight People say hindsight's a wonderful thing in poker. It's not a wonderful thing at all. It's completely irrelevant. Hindsight's irrelevant in poker. Oh, well, he had a set there and I didn't think that was in, in his reign, so obviously I made a bad choice. No, the choice you make is always made with this, the information that you have available to you at, at that point in time. So that's all you can work with. And what you need to work on as a poker player is your faculty of decision-making at point of decision. What do you know? How do you use that information to make the best choice? So when you review your session, turn off the whole cards, replay the hand, pretend you have no idea what villain has, or better yet, accept that it doesn't actually matter in the slightest what he had in that one showdown. Review the hand like it's someone else's hand and you don't know the outcome of it. What should you do based on point of decision? It's a skill. It takes a while to detach yourself from the results of a hand, but it's so worth it. When you get into the subjective way of, of mechanically analyzing your own play, 
you reach a point where your whole process is just streamlined to find the objective truth and not be distorted and deluded by results that are not actually central to that decision. Sample results orientation is when people don't appreciate how small a certain sample that they've played is. I have a lot of students and some of them are a low volume players because they have jobs and they're only like two tabling right now, six max, because they're learning the ropes and they're getting coached by me and they're just really working on their game right now, not volume and not making a bunch of money. That's not the priority yet. It's building up their foundational game first. But in the, within this, especially within this low volume player um, demographic, there are a lot of people who will say things like, I'll say, how's it going? And this is always a bad question for me to ask at the start of a coaching session because it's too vague because inevitably what they'll say is it's going good I'm up six buy-ins this week or it's going terrible I'm getting crushed in these last few days and again the focus just darts immediately to the short-term results I've had students say things like well I feel like I'm really crushing this game and I'll say okay what's your sample and they'll say 2,000 hands and I mean like honestly you can play 2,000 hands in zoom in a few hours like a couple hours it's nothing it's just basically a minute sample over which fish can win massively, lose massively, regs can win big, win small. Of course, if you're a good reg, you're more likely to profit over 2k hands or 3k hands than you are if you're a fish, but it's not by very much. And you'd just be amazed how small edges are in poker or post streak. They're very small. So your job is not to crush over 3k hands. That's great if you are. That's fine. You're on a heater. Nice but your job is to crush over 100k hands. That's a much better sample for determining your true win rate. So another thing people will do as well, my win rate's 19 BB per 100 over like a, like 5,000 hands. Again, like it's completely irrelevant. I've had a win rate of 40 BB per 100 over 10k before. You can go on insane heaters like that. It happens. It doesn't mean that my win rate's anywhere near that good. So this is dangerous because it creates what's known as a newbie circle of death or at least was known as that back in the day. It's an old concept that was always floating around poker forums when I was first getting started in this game. And it basically means that the the more you think that you're great, the harder it hurts when you fall and the more likely you are to just be deluded and fall into a trap of being overconfident. So when you go ahead and play like the smallest sample and you're crushing over it, you know, you are going to there's a danger that you're going to build up this image of yourself, the self-image that you are a winner and you're supposed to win. So then you go around throwing your weight around the forums like, oh yeah, well, you should do this and I know this because I win and you become like arrogant. Poker community is not too bad for this. Really terrible community for that. Something like League of Legends or like some online competitive video game just full of little brats. Poker, you need a backbone to play. You need a bit of maturity or you're not going to get anywhere. If you're one of these ego-mad kids, you're just going to implode and destroy yourself because you won't be able to handle it, frankly, the variance and the fact there's money involved. So poker's not too bad for this, but people, there are players who exist that fall into this trap, this newbie circle of death of overrating their ability based on small sample sizes or perhaps even worse, underrating their ability based on running bad over like 5, 10, 15K, what, 20K hands, whatever. You can run bad over 20K, you can lose at 4 BB per 100, even though you're a 5 BB per 100 winner. Easy. And if you then quit poker because of those 20k hands, because that constitutes two months for you because you're a low-volume player, you've just walked away from a game you could have been really successful at long term. So it works both ways. Small samples are small. Make your goals process-orientated, not results-orientated. Stop this. It doesn't work. It's not good for your game. It's delusional. And the more you play around, go to pokerdope.com, variance calculator, play around with it, see for yourself the truth. That doesn't mean you're going to know it long term. Your subconscious is it's a real bastard of a mind and it's still going to come back at you and be like, no, this is bad, you're losing over 4k, you must be a fish. It's still going to tell you this because it can't accept the patterning that life and nature is ingrained within it that results are caused by level of ability in the short term. They are in a lot of things, they're not in poker. But it's your job to constantly remind your subconscious not to do this, no matter how tempting it is, no matter how difficult you find it to rein in the subconscious mind, you've got to say, look, this is bullshit. We know, you know, the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, both of us know deep down that this is not the case, that 3K hands does not determine my success as a poker player. So stop it. You just got to drill it in over and over and over again until you 
minimize results orientation. You're never going to be free of it. This is always going to be an inner working of your mind you can't fully control, but you can control it to the extent that it that you minimize the impact it has on your on your game, on your outlook, on your approach to poker, and that's what you should be looking to do. So many people fail because they play a small sample and run away from the game. It's so sad. So many people fail because they think they're so much better than they are. Or just because they drive themselves crazy because they obsess so much over results that it affects their state of mind, their life, everything, and then they can't handle it anymore, so they quit. They Some of these guys are guys with potential that could have made it, and that's what's sad. So this is important. If you do this, it's not just a small deal. It's not just like, oh, your results are orientated. Get over it. No, it's actually an outlook failing that is likely to decimate your chances of success in poker. So treat it with respect and deal with it. Next one is represented by this photo here. What do you think this means? Note the time on the clock. It says 3 a.m., I'm guessing. So this is what I would call practical game issues. I separate poker, as you'll know if you're one of my students or have watched a lot of my videos, into three different games. The practical game, the technical game, and the mental game. The technical game is straightforward. It's the strategy. It's whether you should 3-bet his king in this situation, etc. The mental game is pretty straightforward as well, although it's definitely neglected, and we'll get to that later on. Um, and, but the practical game is not such a familiar term. I believe it's one that only I have, have seen in my own videos. It probably does exist. People probably have different ways of referring to this, but I call it the practical game. And what the practical game is, is how you approach poker as a professional, as someone who's serious about it. When do you play? What hours do you play? What state of mind are you in when you're playing? How long are your sessions? Do you table select? Do you site select? What site? What's your bankroll management? How do you make sure that you're in a good state of mind? Like, do you are you distracted? Are you doing other things at the same time? Is your girlfriend in the same room, nagging you because you've not like cleaned the toilet recently or something? These things are not useful. You know, if you're having to to deal with like a dog jumping all over you or the cat knocking stuff into your lap while you're playing. Or the girlfriend, or the that sounds really sexist. Like the, the women nag about cleaning the toilet. Could be the boyfriend as well. That happens. Guys are bitches. I've seen some guys that are much worse than women in relationships. So don't think I'm going down the whole chauvinistic route there. But anyway, um, don't end up like this guy. You know, think I don't know what that is all over his face. I'd like to think it's just coffee, but I don't think that much coffee could have come out of that tiny mug. So who knows. But don't end up like this, 3 in the morning, like zombified, just bashing the mouse into the monitor, just playing for the sake of playing. Think about your practical game, you're professional, you're taking this seriously, you're trying to make money from it. This is not just a hobby that you're doing because, oh, you love clicking buttons. If it is, then fair enough, but you probably wouldn't be watching this video and going through all this trouble to improve your game if it was. So I'm going to assume that poker is more to you than just like a video game that you play until you were half asleep and then you pass out. Poker is something serious. It's a hobby that makes you money. Or maybe it's even an ambition of what you want to do semi-professionally, professionally, fund some holidays. It's a big deal, you know? Poker's not for the faint-hearted. It's not for anyone that's not really committed to it. So if you're committed to poker, you need to be as professional as, like, a, a professional sportsman would be. You wouldn't catch, like, okay, some, there are exceptions, but most professional footballers or whatever, soccer players, for those of you in the States, you wouldn't catch them like shooting up like drugs into their veins the night before the game. It's an extreme example here. You wouldn't catch them, maybe you'll take one that's less extreme, going out on a binge drinking night before their match the next day because they would play terribly and they would stop getting a game for their team. They'd probably get sacked, get dropped from the team and then they'd be earning less money. It's the same for a poker player. Like if you're wondering why your role keeps busting because you're getting up you're going to the pub and coming home drunk and playing four times higher, then you're still waking up the next day sober and expecting to do okay, and expecting to get somewhere long term. You're deluding yourself. You've got to you got to take this seriously. Um, so here are some ways in which students who come to me for coaching have serious practical game issues. They play drunk, and this is not to say that they're like an alcoholic or they have like a serious like drinking problem. It's just that. When they do drink, they really, really love playing poker, so they combine the two things. Maybe they just like to, if they're not doing anything else on a Friday night, they'll fire up some tables and have some beers while they're playing, but it gets out of hand and they start playing badly because they've drunk too much. It could be that they come home from the pub or worse still the club 
at 3 a.m. and just maybe this guy's wasted, maybe that's what's going on here, um, and just fire up some tables and then it's not enough because they're like desensitized due to the alcohol, so they have to play higher to get like the same kind of excitement or they're just, their sense is gone, you know, alcohol doesn't necessarily create urges that aren't there already, but it does lower your inhibitions and it stops the normal safeguards from interact from intervening. Like right now, I can imagine it would be really fun to like win at 500 NL, but I'm not rolled to play that game. And so I'm there's no way in hell I'm going to do it. If I was drunk, I still wouldn't do it, but I would be more likely to do it. And that's the thing. And for some people, alcohol changes their, um, their self-control enormously. For some people, it changes it less, reduces it less, but it's always an issue. So the way I like to do this is if you are really good at controlling yourself, um, when you're drinking and you really love playing poker, drop down a few stakes. Otherwise, or play with friends in a home game or something, do something social, have fun with it. Separate it from your normal stakes, your normal games, your normal grind. Very important you create that barrier. I don't... I mean, I like to drink as much as the next Scottish guy. It doesn't mean I'm going to get wasted and play poker at the same time because I'm a professional and I can't do that. And you should be the same. Um, maybe he plays long sessions when tired. This is a really common one, probably more common than the, the one above, actually. Just ends up kind of slogging away 4 a.m. and playing for the last three and a half hours without a break. You need to take breaks and you need to be aware of your state of mind, your mindful you need to be mindful of how tired you are, how alert you are, how ready your brain is emotionally, how stable it is emotionally, how ready it is to handle some bad variants. Because if you're in the frame of mind where you're like, oh, fucking pissed off and excuse my language, but yeah, you've just had enough. The day's been really bad. Everyone's annoyed you. And then you're going to sit down and you just ask yourself this. How would I feel if I lost a couple of quick stacks? And if the answer is horrific, don't play the session. Playing straight after work, very common thing, you know, your working day, especially if you don't like your job and poker is like almost going to be an, an escape for you in the future if you can get good at it. I was there when I was like 21, worked all night at this casino that was dead, dealing roulette and blackjack and I hated the job. Honestly, I like everything to do with gambling really, but I don't like it when I'm standing at an empty blackjack table just twiddling my thumbs for three hours straight. Um, but I would come home from work and just fire up tables immediately, knackered, eight in the morning, just finish work. I played terribly, um, and that was when I was trying to build myself a poker career right at the beginning before I really knew how to. Um, and this is this is something that you can fix just by being sensible about it. Come home from work, chill out, rewind, like just unwind. That's what, not rewind, unwind, and just chill and give your brain some time. Eat some food, you know. Watch some TV, play a game that you like, something that's not going to drain your brain you know, rebuild your power so you're ready. Then play when you feel alert. Also, don't play like after eating straight away because your body's digesting. It's not, you're going to be lethargic. You're not going to make lots of good decisions. Take a 20 minute break between eating and playing. Don't play just after exercise without eating because you're just going to drain yourself. You're going to end up depleted and suddenly crash. Just common sense things. Um, don't play after you come out of the bath because it doesn't work. Maybe that's just me. I don't know if it's like body temperature is like too high to think straight, but I play so badly if I've just been in a bath. That's one thing I can never do. Plays to get money back, chasing losses. Totally irrational. If you want to play poker because you're playing well and you're making good long-term EV decisions, then go for it. Playing to get the money back is ridiculous. That's like, I don't know. It's like trying to control what the weather's going to be tomorrow. I'm going to sit here and draw a sun on paper so that it's sunny tomorrow. That's the same kind of logic as playing to get your money back. Because you can't control whether or not you get your money back. You can easily lose more. And if you're playing badly because you're trying to get your money back, you're just likely to lose more money. I mean, logically, it doesn't make any sense. So just set a stop loss if you struggle from this. Make sure that you're not, every time you catch yourself with this chasing instinct, that you reason it out, you inject logic to the effect of, I'm more likely to lose more money right now than to gain any back. I get it back in the long term by playing well. It's not even really lost. Money won is not won. Money lost is not lost in poker. That's the rule until you've played a much bigger sample. That's why you need a bankroll. This one is just so dumb, but it's actually quite common. And I've been guilty of doing, maybe not watching a movie, because I'm not really into movies so much, but 
you know, like sitting with my guitar on my lap, like playing my guitar while also playing poker. And then I'll be like, right, I'm going to play some guitar now. Oh, look, a hand came up. Have to put the guitar down. Pick it up again the next hand. Play the guitar again. It's just, it doesn't make any sense. But people have different ways of doing this. So yours might not be playing the guitar. It might be like going on Facebook or emailing people or going on Skype or getting your phone out. I got this friend that's just always on his phone. Whenever he's not doing anything, like whenever he's not completely engaged in like a conversation or something else, he's just, the phone comes out, head like stares into it, like just gone into another world. People have this on computers as well. I've seen it where I've even been coaching people and they've just like randomly brought up a browser and started reading the news. And I'm like, what are you doing? I mean, that boring a coach, but it's not. It's just because people are, some people are conditioned to just always do the go-to thing that they do in their downtime. So if their brain switches off for a second, they're going to do that. But if that happens when you're playing poker, then it's hard to get the momentum back and get the thought process flowing naturally. So give poker your full attention. If you're bored, you're not playing enough tables or you're not studying. You can even have range charts up on the screen as well. If you want to fill downtime, you can take player notes. You can do a bunch of stuff. Anyway, I'm going to move on because I'm kind of running out of time to cram all this in. This one's pretty obvious. The old tilt has significant mental game issues due to, there are a number of factors that cause mental game issues. Um, most of the time when my students come to me for coaching, they have at least some mental game issues, whether they're aware of them or whether they appreciate that they have them or not. Don't get me wrong, there's a big disparity. Many students have a pretty good mental game because naturally they're just very rational, calm people who just have a very good handle on their emotion. Other people find it harder to control their emotion. We're all different. And if you're one of these people that struggles with emotion in life and in different situations and finds it difficult to moderate their emotion levels, then you're going to have to work harder than the more leveled out people are when it comes to controlling the mental game. But everyone has to work to some extent. So one of the biggest reasons that my students fail due to mental game issues is that they don't give the mental game the respect it deserves. Some of them are just like, oh yeah, well, I didn't really hire a coach to talk about me being angry. That's my problem. I want to talk about whether I should 3 bet 7 suited in this spot. So I'll always say to them, that's fine. You know, it's up to you. This isn't like a common thing. Most people are really understanding and they say, yes, I, I agree with you. We need to work on my mental game. That's great. So that's what I'm there for as well. That's an area that I've dedicated a bunch of time to in my own sort of coaching game, if you like. But sometimes people think that they don't need to work in the mental game because they just need to stop it. It's like, no, no, that's cool. You know, I get angry, but I just need to stop that. Then I'll be fine. Well, if you could stop it that easily, you would have done. So you need to give this more respect. Like these subconscious patterns that make you act in ways you hate, you know, you're not doing them just because you haven't bothered to stop it. You're doing them because you can't stop it without help and without getting a clearer approach. Read The Mental Game of Poker by Jared Tenler. Great book. It's what I base my mental game teaching off of. Um, read that for sure. Also, like just read other stuff about just sports psychology, like succeeding in life. Um, there's a lot of stuff out there. Meditation's good. Mindfulness. We'll get to all this. So sometimes people suffer in the mental game of poker due to emotional instability in life. It could be temporary or permanent emotional instability. It could be that they're going through a rough time right now. And if that's the case, it probably means that they need to play a bit less poker than usual. Study a bit more. You know, don't overwhelm yourself with like stress, the stress of variance. If you're already really, really stressed out in life, you're not going to handle it. You're not going to play well. You will tilt. So this is the thing. Like poker is stressful. Variance is not easy to deal with. The human brain doesn't handle it well. So if you're already emotionally unstable because things have gone wrong in life, take a week off. Take a month off if things are really bad. You know, don't play poker and don't expect to do well psychologically at the mental game of poker unless you've got a relative degree, relatively high degree of mental stability in life or you're very, very versed at separating poker from the rest of your emotion, which takes a lot of time in practice. Could be that it's a permanent thing, that there's just anger issues, like, I don't know, depression, insecurity, all kinds of stuff that can, that can be there in the poker player's mind. Poker players are quite eccentric in general, a lot of them, a lot of us. 
And I think a lot of us actually are more prone to to being emotionally unstable than perhaps other hobby people that have other hobbies. I don't know. I think there's just something about the type of person the poker attracts. The kind of I was thinking outside the box dreamer that wants to wants to succeed at something that gives them maximum freedom. For those of us that want to be professional anyway, there's other ones of us who are just fascinated by the game and completely detach it from their success in life. But yeah, a lot of us are emotionally unstable and sometimes I think in order to work on the mental game inside poker, you need to work on your mental game in life outside of poker as well and find ways to do that. That's not really my job so much. We're kind of leaving the fringes of my job there, but it can be an issue and it's something that I'll point students towards like maybe you need to work on this in life and seek help there and that's going to have huge huge turnaround for your poker game as well fear of failure really common thing in poker like it's like an arena where you're battling against other people to succeed if you're afraid that you're going to fail you will you know it's, fear is just as Jared Taylor says in the mental game of poker there's a spectrum of negative emotion of which fear is just one level so there's anxiety like slight worry first and anxiety then fear and then terror and meltdown and it all builds up but fear is like a fairly advanced stage of this so whenever you play a session you're afraid of losing a stack you know that that's a big mental game issue and that's gonna that's gonna hold you back you can also get fear fear of failure in the sense that you're just impatient because you just want to succeed right now and if you don't if you go in a downswing you just think that you know your self-worth is gone you feel like you failed again this goes back to slide number one on results orientation getting a good objective idea of your actual win rate of your own ability and being consistent with that when you know what you're actually capable of and you accept for instance that you're a break-even player you're not afraid anymore because you know that you can fix it and you can improve you know where you are sometimes it's hard to know where to go or how to get there if you don't know where you are so it's always a good idea to figure out what kind of expectation you should have in the game and be very honest with yourself and don't be afraid of failure but embrace that right now you might be failing to meet an unrealistic goal like beating 25 and L when you you're not actually a winner in that game yet so don't expect to win straight away and don't expect that don't think it's a disaster if things don't go your way right from the get-go which brings me on to unrealistic outlooks and goals. Goals can be too results orientated, like I spoke about before. They can be too unreasonable. They can be too demanding. They can place unnecessary, um, excessive pressure on the aspiring poker player. So make sure that your goals, this is why it's good to have a coach that can set you goals that are right for you, the right level, the right areas, the right kind of focus for where your game's at at that point in time. And make sure that your goals are never stuff like have a 16 BB win rate, okay, or have any BB win rate at a certain state by a certain date this is just way too out of your hands you need a goal like work on these focus areas master these concepts improve the practical game in a b and c ways improve the mental game in d e and f ways whatever lack of mindfulness is a real problem for the mental game people are so deluded that they don't even realize when they're tilting like oh, i'm angry right now but no wonder i'm angry i should be angry that's ridiculous that that happened or I'm angry right now and that makes me even more angry. I don't care. Screw it. These kind of thoughts or even just not even thinking about the fact you're angry, just ignoring it and just being angry. That's even worse. Just losing yourself in the tide of anger. Like I used to get really mad as a poker player. I used to suffer from tilt big time when I first started. I was probably more tilty, more emotionally unstable than most poker players of my level when I first started, which is bad because it's quite an unstable community. Um, and one of the ways that I was able to actually get around this and improve is to actually realize when I was angry and say, I am mad right now. Okay, I need to deal with this. Or I'm mad right now and just leave it at that. When you realize that you're angry, anger dissipates. Same with any emotion. When you realize that you're experiencing an emotion, it becomes easier to heal and like, get over that emotion. You have to accept if you have a tell problem. Like this dude here that's punched through this laptop, at this point, it's kind of a bit too late. I mean, he's just wrecked like probably a few hundred pounds or dollars worth of equipment there. But maybe if he'd, you know, 10 seconds earlier said, I am so furious right now. Deep breath. I am really angry. I am so mad. I should sit out these tables and just accepted it. Like it's rare to get angry because you're angry. I've never really had that before. Like when I've been mindful of my anger in poker, it's usually helped me 
to move past it. So I think there's a lot to say about mindfulness in general. You can do you guys can do a lot of your own reading on this that's really useful for the mental game as well. Just throwing ideas out, things that can help. Um, right, I'm gonna move on because I'm really running out of time. Remember this dude, the forever alone troll face guy. Um, this is all about community. I always say this over and over again, but I got to where I am today in poker because I had a community working with me at the beginning. Really good players, really helpful players. Sure, they would they would you know give you a slap in the wrist and tell you when you were being a results orientated idiot, but they were always there for you when you basically put the right work in and you showed that you wanted to learn these players, these really experienced players back in 2008 and stuff, they were always there for me and they supported me so much and vice versa. When I got more advanced on the forums, you know, I would do the same thing for others and community is so important. That's why I have like over 50 students in my online group because they support each other and they're really friendly and we create a positive learning environment. The students who do well are the ones who take part in that. The ones who struggle, there's a very high correlation between isolation and failure in poker. Work with other people, learn socially, that's how we learn as humans. Even if you're not a social person, like do it anyway. There's some reasons why this happens. People are afraid of looking bad in front of others. This is really silly because you have to be bad at some point before you can be good. So if people think, look at the way you've played the hand and think, oh, that's bad, that's great because then they're going to try and help you. They're going to tell you how it's bad and what you should do to improve. There's nothing better like when I'm learning something. I was playing badminton last night and this guy comes up to me, I was playing doubles and he just says like, your backhand grip is wrong. And I was like, amazing. Like as soon as he said that, and he was a really good player, I could see he was a good player, he's my teammate. Um, I was like, wow, like this is an amazing opportunity for me to learn. And I was like, okay, awesome. I was like fully tuned in. It's like, tell me why. Five years ago, if someone had come up and said your backhand grip is wrong, I might have just been like, yeah, well, I don't care. <laughs> like, or I might have like brushed it off or I might have like not wanted to accept that it was wrong or at least felt, or maybe felt patronized or something. But last night I was like, okay, tell me more. I was asking questions and that's because I'm used to this community thing from poker and being told I'm bad. That's something I dealt with a lot back in the day and that really helped my ego problems and stuff. So fear of looking bad is not a reason not to post and get involved. You need to get involved. Fear of being berated, kind of the same thing. You grow a thick skin as you go and I try and run a group that's friendly and no one breaks anyone. If you are in a forum where people berate each other, you need to grow a thick skin. It's not necessarily a bad thing if it makes you tougher. Fear of finding out you're not very good at poker. Well, guess what? You're probably not and you need to find that out anyway. So the sooner you accept that, the better. Antisocial personality traits, maybe, but no one's asking you to go and make small talk here. All we're asking you to do, you know, I don't like... There are times when I feel antisocial and I can't be bothered speaking to anyone. I just want to sit and chill out on my own, sure. But we're not asking you to sit and talk about what you did last weekend. We're just saying post a hand and be as full as you can with the information you give and try and work with other people and share ideas. It's not really about socializing. It's more about interacting and sharing ideas within a, the field of poker. It's important. This will be the last one, and this is about spoon feeding. No prizes for guessing that one. This baby looks particularly brain dead, like it's literally a poker zombie baby. If this baby was my student, I would literally just be like, do I call or fold? And I'd be like, well, why do you think you should maybe call? Do I call or fold? I would just be like gobbling up the, the one word answers. This is a terrible way to be. If I find a student that wants spoon fed, I slap out of them very, very quickly. Like they're not gonna get, next session, they're not gonna be like that anymore, because I love like, beaten out of them. Even if I have to hurt their feelings in the process, I'll do it because it's worth it. Asking direct to the answer questions is one way in which this manifests. Like people will say things on my group like, is this too loose a call? And that's it. And then a hand history. And then inevitably one of the more experienced members will come on and they'll say, well, why might it be too loose a call? What do you think is relevant in this situation? What are the relevant factors? Or Maybe they'll give a bit more help than that and be like, what do you think of these three relevant factors? How do these relate to your decision and what does, does that help you? And they'll lead them to the answer. And this is good teaching. Good teaching is eliciting answers from people, teaching them the thought process, like the giving them the net instead of just the fish, showing them how to catch their own fish. This is good teaching. Like, sorry to use a ridiculously stupid cliched analogy there, but yeah, I can be bothered thinking up an, an original one. 
200 videos, come on. I've been doing this for, for years. I'm old. So leave me alone. Um, anyway, so like this is this is something that we can fix very easily because when you're a learner, you'll quickly realize, or you should realize anyway, that you're not getting anything, not getting anything out of just saying, do I do this or that? Like, I mean, I can say, do I call or fold here? And someone can tell me you should fold. If I don't understand why that hasn't helped me in the slightest, I've gained nothing, nothing at all. All I've gained is a confusion because I need to then try and figure out why that's the case. So you need to get to the why. That's really important. Not asking why enough is a big problem. Posting hands without a thought process. Okay, we can tell you what you did wrong, but we can't tell you what thoughts were wrong that caused your decision. Post your thought process street by street in the forums at Grinder School, in my study group, wherever you post, with your friends on Skype, whatever. Copying without understanding. Again, like you saw an instructor do something, you think you should just do it, but you don't understand why, so you misapply it in the wrong spots. Poker is far too complicated to fit a paradigm of just do this in this spot. It doesn't work like that. The spots are too subtly different at some level you might not be aware of. So you need to understand the elements of each situation and then how to assess those and how to come to decision by assessing those. And then people wonder why. They wonder why they can't apply what they're learning. Like, oh, I just studied all this. Why can I not? Why is it not making sense in game? Well, note that learning there is in inverted commas because you're not learning anything if you're just getting spoon fed, if you're just saying, do I do this or that? Or is this bad? Is this good? A really common one is like, is this too weak? Or is this too aggro? Is this too adjective is like one of the worst ways you can formulate a poker question. It's so bad because it's often arbitrary and completely removed from Eevee. It's like people will say things like, don't call there, it's too passive. And I'll be like, right, so this means nothing. How does it being too passive relate to Eevee? Like, what are you talking about? And then they won't be able to tell me. And it's like, don't fall into that trap. Your job is not to not be too any of the adjectives in poker, too aggro, too passive, too tight, too, too loose, too spewy. Your job is to make the highest Eevee choice. So what factors are central to Eevee and how can you maximize those in your favor in each situation? If that involves doing something that's very objectively passive per se, then who cares? You've traced EV, you've followed EV. That's fine. Don't fall into that trap of just like asking those kind of stupid questions. All right, guys, this is the end of my 200th video for Grander School, and apparently I can't speak. I'm like messing up all my words today. Um, I'm just about to do a coaching session, so hopefully that goes away in a minute so my student doesn't have to listen to the blah, 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 blah. Anyway, it's been a pleasure um, making this video and all the 199 that came before. I've only got one more thing, one more slide to present, and that is to say thank you to lots of people. Firstly, um, I feel like I've won an award at an Oscar here and I'm like giving a speech. It's not that way at all. I just want to show a bit of gratitude because although I get paid obviously to make videos for you guys, I do also really enjoy it and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be an instructor and a coach and be able to do two things I love, like teaching and playing poker. Um, Combining those two things, poker and teaching, is like a dream for me. So my first thank you is to JGB Jeffrey, um, the owner of GrinderSchool.com, for paying me to play poker and rent, which are right to two of my favorite pastimes, I guess, in life. There are others, but those are up there. Um, so basically, yeah, for just having me as an instructor on the site for all this time and giving me loads of video slots and always being very understanding about, you know, when videos are late or things go wrong or technical things hitches and glitches and stuff like that so yeah i'd like to thank all my poker friends the guys who are my students who have become my good friends in carrot corner the community um to people i speak to in real life about poker there aren't many of them um and to anyone online that i've i've met a bunch of friends through poker throughout the years some of them i've met up with in real life and stuff like that and yeah thank you to them for helping me in the beginning and even now and just studying the game and you know community makes success in this game so that's really it's been really important um thanks to all my students for allowing me to work this dream job of teaching poker for a living and making this job a pleasure like they're always really cool it's very rare i guess you might don't like teaching and they're always really amicable and friendly and they make it a joy to like teach the same game over and over again for sure and also to all of you Grinder School members who watch my videos, the feedback you've given me over the years is always really useful. The encouragement you've given me um, and for, you know, just getting involved and, and stuff like that. For those of you who get involved, involved in the forums and on the video threads, 
and for for watching because without an audience there would be there'd be no poker instruction and finally in real life i don't know if any of them will ever watch this the non-poker players but for all the open-minded friends and family who never doubted it was possible to be a professional poker player or teacher um you guys will probably know this yourselves like when you're when you tell people that you're a poker player especially if you're pro or semi-pro um, they're always going to be that segment of the population who shrivel up their face at you in their little close-minded box. And they don't know anything about poker, but they just have this inherent fear that it's bad because it's gambling or whatever. And yeah, I've been very lucky in that both of my parents have always supported me in poker. And they've always, you know, my dad's a very logical guy, chess player and stuff, and he's always been very encouraging, you know, that... I might not be taking a conventional route in life or be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, but I'm doing something I, I love. And, you know, when you've got people that stand by you when you're doing something that's slightly controversial, that always helps. So to all the friends and family, like, who have been open-minded and believed in me, that's something that you guys as aspiring poker players definitely want. You definitely want to keep the open-minded people in your life who are curious about poker and want to understand it and or, you know, want to find out what it's all about rather than the ones that want to preach stuff they don't actually know. That's really key. So, yeah, thanks for the last 200 vids. I've enjoyed making them. And finally, here's to another 100 videos in the future. I'm going to have to sign off for now, and I will be back with video characters 201, which will be on some kind of new interesting topic, I hope, in the next week so thanks for watching leave me comments questions feedback if you've got anything to say about this format and that kind of video there'll be another something like this in 100 vids or maybe before so stay tuned and thanks again for all the watching and advice and feedback you've given me throughout the years guys and good luck at the tables bye for now